What is up, guys? <laughs> Welcome back to the Comic Cave. We've got an exciting night. We're going to interview for the first time. Our first interview at the cave Wow, is going to be Who Rodney Barnes. You mean the writer of we, The Army of Darkness, no, 1979? No, need no. A hawk. Need a hawk. no, Philadelphia, the writer of Mandalorian. The Mandalorian's so hot right now. Uh, dude, we're so hyped. We cannot wait. He's a, a Peabody Award winner, NCAA CP, CP Award winner, Eisner and a Award Eisner nominated. Award nominated series. And we're going to talk to him soon. So. We can't wait, Rodney. Here we are. We just want to start by saying thank you again for joining us. Um, we love everything you've done so far in comic books. Thank you. Uh, TV, you're a legend in TV. <laughs> like, thank you, thank you. Like, um, I want to start off by asking, uh, Zombie Love Studios, mm -hmm. what is that to you? Uh, Zombie Love Studios is my own publishing imprint that is... Um, Starting in January, we hope to publish Blackula is the first book, uh, first trade that we're um, releasing then. And probably we're going to try to go monthly with different trades of different books that we're all assembling now. Um, I've got celebrity talent attached to some of those books that I can't talk about right now, but um, each book will have its own distinctive uh, trademark, they will be um, ho mostly horror, mystery, that type of stuff. Nice, nice. Um, you, you said a collaborating, uh, is Snoop Dogg a part of the zombie love? <laughs> He's not a part of the ownership, you We're know, ownership, but uh, we, be one of the first yeah, we may be partner. Life. We may be partnered on a book together. Yeah. So there's no uh, slated date for that yet? Not for that one. Um, they all come because they're trades you know they're like 120 pages each and they all go through a process um that's different than just doing floppies you know there'll be hard covers and soft covers and it's a lot it's a lot more than i ever thought um i thought it was a lot easier than this but um it's a lot that goes into each one of these books they're more prestige books than they are just sort of um you know just regular floppies yeah, they'll look nice on the bookshelves. They will look nice on the bookshelves. Exactly. I was exactly. going to segue to uh, Philadelphia is finally being collected in a hardcover. Yeah, volume one. Yeah, I love hardcover. <laughs> then I've been waiting for it, and it's finally coming out in November. And definitely, we're going to be picking that one up because it looks fantastic on the shelves. Like you said, the prestige ones always look great. Yeah, volume mm -hmm. one and two. I'm excited about that. Can't wait. Nice. Was that always the like plan? Was to start your own publishing? Um, it wasn't always the plan. I think it was just a thing of where I had a bunch of stories that I wanted to tell that I really didn't want to have to go to another publisher for permission uh, to tell the stories. And I had unique relationships with some folks that, you know, we had, we'd all kind of bounced around ideas amongst each other and, um, you know, wanted to do some things. And it's hard enough when you're one person that has an idea that has to go to a publisher that has to go through a process of being approved. Uh, which can take months, sometimes, if not years. And I didn't want to go through that anymore. I wanted to, in on some things, you know, some things, of course, my work with Marvel and other companies, um, you know, that's more work for hire than anything else. But the stuff with images create our own. And I just wanted to have more of a say on um, the stuff I do. Nice. Is that why we uh, we haven't gotten the Swamp Thing yet, Rodney? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Um, I can't say anything, but who knows? You may be oh, oh, who, knows? who knows? Who knows? It could be coming. I can't say it will or won't, you know, but it could be. It could nice. be. And, and we've loved everything you've done, man, with, with uh, like, uh, Nita Hawes. I know with uh, Philadelphia, you have Jason Sean Alexander. And I think for Blackula, you got Jason Sean Alexander. It's like, that's probably, you know, that's. That's the Shaq and Kobe combination right there, man. We love it. Um, how did that whole relationship come about? Were you reading Spawn or did you did you happen no. to pick up a comic? How did you come into contact with Jason? I uh, was hired uh, by a company many years ago to interview Jason for a uh, art book. And um, we met, we, we realized we only lived a mile apart from each other. And we met at a restaurant and we did the interview and we just kept meeting like every few weeks or so we would get together and 
we would bounce around ideas and I would hate his ideas and he would hate my ideas. <laughs> and one night he was drinking uh, at dinner and um, I pitched him Philadelphia. And he said, I liked that. And I was thinking it was the liquor. I didn't think he was he was ever going to do anything with it. And um, he called me the next day and he said, that vampire thing with John Adams, um, have you put it down on paper? And I said, I haven't, but I could. And so that night I sort of put together a couple of pages and um, he pitched it to Image. And, um, well, they read the pages and said, yeah. Oh, wow. So you put two pages together in one night and you said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> that's a good thing. I write pilots of television in a day, so I can write a couple of pages, you know, <laughs> you know it's not that it's not if you know, if I know what the idea is, if I've already sort of thought it through and this one I've been thinking on for a long time. So I sort of knew what it was. Yeah, I, I noticed you did that with the Army of Darkness 1979. At the end of the trade, you put down what your pitch was for it. And it, yeah. it did change in the story, but it, mm -hmm. it was all right there. And it was so simple, but you were able to yeah. shit out and four issues. And it was, was that a, was that a fun project that you were, you were. It, it was, uh, you know, Army of Darkness doesn't have a whole lot of story per se. And it is sort of like a bunch of, um, a bunch of situations, you know, it's more or less putting Nash in different situations. And um i really love the movie the warriors yeah. and yes. you can tell <laughs> <laughs> if you can put him to uh if you could take ash and put him in the 70s and i sort of like that gritty idea of new york in the 70s that martin scorsese kind of taxi driver 70s um you know i thought the two would just fit really well and be a lot of fun i, I gotta ask when you when you're approaching comics is that totally different than uh your your tv scripts or no a lot, tighter, a lot looser how, how, how do you collaborate um when i was when i got my first job in comics on falcon um in 2017 uh i had no idea what i was doing and you think because you read comic books so i thought because i read comic books for so long that this must be easy you know i write movies and tv shows this is simple and I remember when I first turned my first script into Marvel, they were like, you know, this is ponderous to read. There's so many words. And I had never thought about the relationship between words and art. It just sort of never struck me in the way that it needed to as far as rhythm is concerned, rhythm of storytelling. And so it took me three or four issues to sort of figure out my own voice in comics um, is still, I mean, it's still ongoing, but to figure out how to effectively tell a story with as few words as possible and allow the art to tell the story as well. And in television, movies, you got actors, you know, and actors talk and you have editing and you have a lot of different, yeah, the camera does a lot of work. And um, But with comics, you just have a flat image and how you assemble those images and the rhythm of those images along with the words is really they are. And I had to um, I had to learn that. I had to learn pacing. I had to learn to do, you know, a lot of things. So between from Falcon to Lando to Incredible um, to Philadelphia, uh, and now Nita and, you know, the others, each one is sort of like, I'm experimenting sometimes with figuring out how to tell stories differently or more effectively. And, you know, Philadelphia certainly since it's been ongoing for 25 issues now, 26, I guess I just turned in 26 script. Um, you know, still a process of evolving. You see the story is way different than it first started. You know, it's nowhere near what it once was. And that's really more of a process of me trying to keep Jason engaged. Um, so, yeah. Nice. Being a Star Wars writer now, were you a big Star Wars fan growing up? I was a fan. Um, you know, I wasn't as uh, maniacal a fan as some of the people that I've come to meet <laughs> all the time. Like, you know, they weren't, you know, I, oh, I came yeah. up. Lucas, are you? <laughs> not at all. It, it's more of a no anger, uh, but I understand that a lot of people are. I mean, I think for me, I grew up when it was a movie and there wasn't a whole lot of merchandising attached to it and toys and costumes and lightsabers and stuff 
And so I took it like a movie that I really enjoyed, um, like I did Alien and The Thing and a, a bunch of other movies. And somewhere along when, um, you know, the second trilogy came out, it started to evolve into something else. And I saw it happening, but, you know, I had sort of moved on to other things and then I came back to it. And um, really The Mandalorian had played a big role because um, I love the Western type feel to it and um, the way that it, uh, it just feels so different and the pacing is slower. Is I remember when um, I saw the Lando movie and it's like it went from set piece to set piece to set piece. To, it went so fast that um, it was hard for me to grasp it in the same way that I did like The Empire Strikes Back. If you watch that movie, not that it was slow, but the pacing of those first three movies were different. You know, now they just move so fast. And I get it. You know, it's a different generation, a generation that's accustomed to a different type of storytelling, but I sort of like um, a slower pace of telling the story. Talking about merchandising, uh, are we going to start seeing like Philadelphia shirts anytime soon? <laughs> they already are Philadelphia shirts. Um, there's a link somewhere. If you go to my, um, if you go to my webpage at RodneyBars.com, I think there's a link that my assistant put on to where you can get Philadelphia t-shirts and mugs and a whole bunch of stuff. All right. Yeah, yeah. There's we'll, a whole we'll bunch of the stuff. Video. So, nice. Yeah. So with you saying you turned into 26 script now and, you know, the, the trying to keep Jason uh, engaged, do you see an end? Yeah. Philadelphia. So, you know, I like, do. Is, OK, there's a big event coming up in Philadelphia at the end of arc five. Um, and I probably see Philadelphia going to 50 um, issue 50 will probably be the end. Um or in dish, you never know it's vampires. And I enjoy writing it, but um, 50 right now, I think is the um, the magic number. Still a ways away. Yeah, yeah. halfway there. You gotta <laughs> collect it in an absolute <laughs> edition and it's like, yeah. there's plenty of money at that point. <laughs> there you go, there you go. I hope so. <laughs> you can tell we love this. We love your work, man. So. I appreciate that, I appreciate what it. What are some of your influences in comics? Oh man, I mean, it really goes on in stages. When I was a kid, kid, I loved um, Neil Adams, um, who blessed us with a cover for issue five of Philadelphia. Um, Neil Adams, Jim Starlin, George Perez, all of the greats in the beginning when I was a kid. I, I looked at art more than I read the story. You know, it was like, uh, that's what grabbed me. I would open up with who, the cover. The cover was the thing that would grab me. And then the interior art guys like Mike Grell and all of them. And then this weird thing happened when uh, I got in like high school or towards college when Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman and uh, Grant Morrison and guys like that started writing and books became like um, almost literature in a way. Uh, they evolved into a different idea. And, you know, now the business brings me back to it. I don't think there's ever been a period where I was ever away from it, but I've always, for different reasons, um, comics have just been a constant in my life for as long as I can remember. Do you have a pull list right now? Is there anything that you're picking up on a monthly <laughs> that you're like, oh man, that's... Mostly indies. Um, you know, um, something is killing the children and... Um, you know, Ice Cream Man and, you know, those kinds of books, uh, mostly horror indies, you know, grab me a lot. Um, every once in a while, it's funny because I've read so many books. I, I actually collect more books than I actually read at this point. Hey, same. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a, in Bronze Age stuff. I mean, like uh, Bronze Age run of the Teen Titans. Uh, oh, I nice. just bought... Um, the whole run of Teen Titans all right. the way from back the uh, the originals and the Neil Adams ones as well. And sometimes like I'll get bored and I'll just start buying comics. Like I'll sit on eBay and I'll say, who do I want, you know, 
Sandman's out now. I think I want all CGC Sandman's, and I'll just take my time and I'll <laughs> two at a time until I have all of them. And I'm like, all right, what now? Swamp Thing. Okay, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get all. Of them. I want all the rights in one. So I want this. I want that. So it really is a way. I think as I get older to sort of um, still stay connected because the books now universes change. You know, you know, there may be a whole new DC universe, or there could be an event. I remember an event back when. I I was coming up was a huge thing like infinity gauntlet or yeah now they have them all the time you yeah know, every, every month yeah it's like now there's a new um, world changing there's the new 52 or there's the new this and there's the new and there's another dimension and this thing is happening and there's so many books like i grew up there were two batman books you know there was batman and there was detective and maybe world's finest uh and you could find them in a justice league now i go in and i see like 10 batman books you know, and and the continuity. Hey. There is no real continuity. <laughs> Good Batman, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love them. I still love them. It's just hard for me to be connected because it's so much. I yeah. see so much of a thing, and it's moving so fast. Again, I go back. I'm old. You know, it's like I go back and I'm like, okay, so what was the? All right, who was it? Last week he died, right? Okay, he's back. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, you know, and I remember it when it was simple. So yeah. I like simplicity simple times we felt we kind of uh i remember when we were reading elysium gardens mm -hmm. in the back of the philadelphia we're like man this guy's got to cross him over you think he's gonna cross him over we're like, like speculating on, of course he is so <laughs> when they, yeah, it's so, coming so when it finally happened we're like oh that's an event that's an event yes. right there. So, <laughs> and there are three other books that are connected but they're on substack right now um but they may bleed into uh the regular philadelphia universe at some point so um we'll see for the Philadelphia, when they have the variants with the special artists, do you are you the one that picks it or is it that's Jason? Oh, that's Anything Jason. with art, I leave to Jason. I've okay. got more than enough on my hands between. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm like who, TV who got, shows. Who got yeah, Kevin no. Jones? Who got? Uh, yeah, Paul no, Jones. these are. <laughs> he is uh, Jason is leveraging his relationships to get these fine folks to come in. Um, I have absolutely nothing to do with it. Sometimes people hit me, artists will hit me on Twitter or Instagram and be like, hey, I'd love to do an Instagram. I mean, I'd love to do a cover for a variant. I'm like, talk to Jason. You know, I have, I'm so far removed from art, anything to do with art. Funny, you Jasons are all artistic. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll send a message to Jason. <laughs> yeah, Jason is the guy to talk to. I don't, you know, I just, sometimes I don't even know they're coming. You know, it's like, um, Jason will send me an image and I was like, wow, what's that? Oh, it's the variant for next month. Oh, okay, great. You know, I got this person, I got that person. And so it's kind of fun. I think it actually, you know, it's so hard to sell indie books that you sort of have to, um, you know, this cover thing is huge. And when you're trying to create some um, myth to your book or, or something that makes you stand out, it's great that one of the things about Philadelphia is there's sort of a gallery of covers mm -hmm. from some of the best artists, you know, McFarlane and Eric Larson and Scotty Young and, you know, so many people. And like I said, Neil Adams and et cetera, et cetera. You can go down the list and all that's Jason. All that's him. Has there been a cover that you saw and you're just like, you know what, send me the original. I need that on my I own board. the original to Jason's original for the first one. Um, oh, wow. I have that downstairs. Um, and so, yeah, Jason's too expensive for me. Uh, you know, I, I have to, I only get gifts from Jason when I'm sick or, you know, I got to get really depressed or something has to be bad. He's like, here, man, here, take this. But uh, Jason's a fine artist. So, yeah, you know, absolutely. nothing really, uh, nothing's free. With, you know, I know we, we know you love your collaboration with uh, with Jason, but is there an artist that you've been kind of eyeing? You're like, you know what, it'd be, I'd like to send him a script, see what he can do with it. Is there anybody that it's, you It's too many to name. I mean, I love so many guys, but again, a lot of these guys are guys from my era or the guys that now when I go to cons, they're over in the corner and nobody knows who they were. And I'm like geeking out like, wow, there's such and such and so and so. Um, I have, you know, I still commission my, my um, a lot of my heroes to do covers and things for me. As far as storytelling is concerned, you know, I mostly leave that up to um, editors. You know, if they say, would you like to work with this person? Or, 
Sure. I don't know. Most of them I don't even know. And it was, when uh, hopping on eBay and you're looking through all these books, is there a grail that you still haven't been able to, to get your hands on or do you feel like everything's been... Become- um, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I just finished uh, the X-Men the other day. I did all the X-Men from one through... Um, oh, man. One through Jim Lee. You know? um, and I'm perilously close to finishing the Avengers from one to 250. Um, wow. And so not really it's it's really because then you get to a certain point i started looking at this i've got like 20 comic boxes in my um at least 20 in my garage and i'm thinking what am i going to do with all of these things it's like i got them then part of me wants to sell them and then i become territorial and i don't want to get rid of them you know i love them so it's this weird thing where i get them and then i want to get rid of them because they take up so much space but um i love my books I feel the same way. I don't want. I don't want anyone to touch my books, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to get them cataloged and you know to be a professional collector. But you know, we'll see. We'll see. You know, comics. You know that that's been the more recent thing. But I think you know uh, I was re- reading or seeing an interview where you were talking about how you got your start and struggling and the struggles that you know you had to endure to actually get your you know your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. Um, what advice do you have for like this new generation coming up of writers you know that want to try it and 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 and, you know get their footing in the door whether it be for tv writing movie writing comic writing what do you think is like the best advice that you could give them well i think persistence is always um the key to anything being able to hang in there until you get what you want but also to really hone your craft and and really um get as good at knowing what it is you do as you can possibly do it's sort of like what i said with comics when i first started out and i didn't really know what i was doing i knew how to tell a story i knew the basic structure of the first second and third act but there's different mediums demand um different disciplines and you know fortunately for me because i've done different things um I sort of embrace that. I don't really, like I'm writing a movie right now uh, for Netflix and it's a thriller, but it has comedic and dramatic elements. And it's like, you know, I find myself trying to find a rhythm of um, making it all work. So it feels like one thing. And that really comes from having done so many different things. Like I've done sitcoms in the beginning and I'm doing drama and comedy now and, um, genre stuff with the you know sci-fi horror mystery and different things and it's just kind of cool being able to flex all of your muscles and not being able to stay with one so if it's any advice that i have with anyone it's like put as many tools in your toolkit as you possibly can we're super turned on with the horror stuff and all that when you're when you're sitting down to write something that's more comedic or you know more sitcom-ish is is that a whole different process or it, it, you're still hitting the same beat when you sit it's down. all story it's like if you give me a character if you give me a character um that has the it, it's almost like having friends if you have a funny friend still your friend you still can love your funny friend as much as you love your depressed friend um or your anxious friend or whatever adjective you want to put in front of that friend it's just that this person sort of processes information in a way that's more humorous than someone else does there's still a person and so when i approach um a comedy it's like okay everybody's sort of funny in this or four of the five people have a sense of humor and the other one doesn't um drama nobody has a sense of humor you know and and so regardless of what the thing is i just sort of look more at the characters and i say how can i get them to um sort of evoke whatever it is that thing, whether it's funny, uh, comedy, drama, horror, whatever, mystery. Um, of course, some stories are more, if you look at Philadelphia, you know, you have um, Sangster Dad, who at times can get a joke off, um, a Nazi who seems to just be about jokes, um, Seesaw, who's more thoughtful. Um, you know, uh, you never know when a joke is coming. I try to at least put three or four in there to sort of cut the bloody you know um 
bedlam, you know, that's happening all about us. But I think it's important to sort of mix things up. I don't like it when I can predict, um, you know, a couple of the issues coming up in Philadelphia will be funnier probably than some of the others uh, have been because we're in the middle of war and I never want one issue to feel, I want every issue to feel completely different than the one that came before, but still be attached to the same continuity. Being an Eisner nominated, how how would that feel? Like your your first actual your baby of a of a comic book is nominated for that. Like that had a feel. Really um, cool. it was odd. Um, because you know there's so many books. You know, it's like you go in the store and you see so many books. It's like somebody or a bunch of somebody's you know thought that the book that Jason and I do and everybody else is a part of Team Philadelphia do um was worthy i mean it's a it's a huge honor because um i think anybody who does this really doesn't do it just for themselves you know you do it for the audience there's a part of it that's yours you know i, I have to I, i try to write with my heart anything that i really think i've written relatively well comes from my heart and philadelphia is truly a passion thing and I have to get my mind in a certain state in order to be able to write it. I have to, okay, I'm sad today and I'm going to write Philadelphia. This is going to be a sad one. Somebody's got to die. Um, <laughs> but when you get to the Eisner thing and you look at the kinds of people who are on there and been on there or perennially on there, um, it, it's big time stuff. We were a little upset about that, by the way. I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. I was, I was honored just to be in the conversation. It's like, it's, cool. it's the same thing with television. I mean, you want to be, there's a part of you that wants to be sort of appreciated by your peers. You know, it, it's hard when you're sitting in a room by yourself writing a story that you don't know whether this is good, bad, someplace in between. And then you have your peers jump out and say, we really dug this. And people who do this and people who appreciate this process, appreciate your work. It's really, a, it's a great thing. I remember we uh, we actually, I think Black Widow took it that year. Black Widow, yes. Black Widow won. And yes. We, we, yeah, we read it and then we looked at each other. And we're like, I mean, it's good, but it's not Philadelphia good. <laughs> so <laughs> all due respect to the creators, but you know, we were kind of like. <laughs> any, any, our comic store that we go to sponsors us and they're like, Anytime Philadelphia comes out, we're like, just think of that as our pick of the week. But we yeah. can't pick Philadelphia it's, it's every hard. month. It's hard. We, we like to pick other stories because we're, we're also very independent. There, there, there are other books that came yeah. out this week, but pick up Philadelphia and yeah. here are the rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, We appreciate it. Be, it used to be um, I would pick up, you know, uh, anytime I had it, like there was a discount book sale or anything like that. I always pick up Saga, Sandman. Um, multiple copies of uh, Dark Knight Returns, Watchmen, as books that I would give out. People mm -hmm. always ask me, and now Philadelphia's been added to that list. So anytime we find one, it's you know, it's been, even if it's been marked down half off, like all right, pick up both of those copies that you have right there because those are the ones we give out as gifts. And yeah. people often ask us, you know, what's what's a good comic book? And you know, we tell them, all right, well, do you like superheroes? Do you not like superheroes? Well, let me ch check this one out. Check this Philadelphia, and they're just what they're they're hitting me up, texting me, saying, yo, man what was that i was like right he's like whoa and they're like where where do i keep going so that's that's how we've been able to get more people into the comic shop is by so just wanted to let you know you know no thank uh, you has been partly responsible for that yes thank you very much we and, really really appreciate it and when we talk to people about it you know they start getting deeper into it they think they appreciate the characters and like you said and and hearing you talk about you know the different mood, uh, moods you find yourself in and that's how you write philadelphia mm -hmm. i i think there's a big appreciation for you know having your character suffer like, yes most of the time a lot of writers don't want their characters to suffer but we've always argued i think when you love a character so much to put him through the ringer and, and really have him grow like i think one of the most heartbreaking uh uh, uh you know uh some of the most heartbreaking pages was when uh dad and philadelphia was about to finally be reunited with mom in the afterlife yes yes he ripped away and he's just like really that'd be really important still be yes. like man like that that hurt because you realize man all this man's want is just to be happy be with his wife again and it's just he has a mission he has to complete it and he's still part of this puzzle that he has to 
And it's if like that it, hurt. Stop. You're about to be really hurt. Oh man, <laughs> <of weeks. laughs> you're about to be really I mean, hurt. Was, there's uh, a lot of pain. Oh, man. And then we're to get your therapy. Yeah. Dude, and then with Nina Haas, man, the whole thing with the little brother, it's just like, man, yeah. Rodney, why are you why you yeah. got me like this? She's, I love her. She's, she's gone through some. Yeah, uh, she's gone through. She's, yes. I like you know, it's weird. I think for any of us who are fortunate enough to be alive and fortunate enough to be able to have conversations about this and things that we love. Um, it's sort of juxtaposed to the difficult parts of life. You know, we all have them. We all lose people, get sick, and eventually we will lose ourselves. And anytime you can write about an experience and connect um, to other people, you know, your feelings and, and hopefully make entertain them and make them feel like... Um, they have something to look forward to. I was talking to um, Patton Oswalt uh, the other day, and um, who's a fan of Philadelphia. That's actually how we connected. Um, and he was saying a similar thing. You know, comic books at one time in life were like a disposable thing. They were 20 cents. You know, that's why they weren't so, a lot of them, you know, because you would read them and you could throw them away. And, but I think as they began to become more layered and became more like art, a lot of the feelings and things that we were dealing with, whether it was issues of politics, culture, you know, war, race, whatever it was, you know, issues, I think they have a way of um, bringing meaning, you know, to an experience. And so I try to write from that place, you know, I try to write from that place and, and hopefully I've had a lot of people or a good number of people come to me and say, you know, my dad was like that, or I've gone through something like that, or I had issues with my wife, like John and Abigail, um, or whatever it is, like whatever you can sort of tap into to sort of connect with people. And I think it's really, really cool. And when I can go to conventions and talk to people who really look at your work and it means something to them, it's a reason to go through this suffering of not really having a life life where you're just tied to a desk writing all day every day um being able to have people who appreciate what you do is a beautiful thing speaking of Patton Oswalt did you ever pick up minor threats from him I have not okay. I will I'm surprised I said that out loud you know he was almost <laughs> he almost got up and left our breakfast because I hadn't watched Sandman yet oh. <laughs> <laughs> well his, his book was actually the pick of the week when it came out so we're I'm like, sure he, this he's guy, brilliant yeah. he's a it's genius so of course yeah. it should be it should be I don't know if Philadelphia was out that week also so <laughs> it's all right he can win we all win it rising tide lifts all boats I'm good there you go so you're you're shopping you're you're at the supermarket you're you're getting your vegetables your meat whatever it is mm -hmm. uh somebody comes up to you what do you what do you want them to say to you, do you i love your work you want to blow them off how, how does that go it's funny because it's according where to where i am and what with everything with me it's moved you know um seven and a half out of ten times i'm in a pretty affable state so if you find me in that, that that's kind of cool. And what I've gotten recently, because I do this show on HBO called Winning Time, and I act on that show occasionally as Maurice, the head of Lego Security. Yeah. And so I've had people say, hey, you're that guy that's on the Lakers show, you know? And I go, yeah, I'm that guy. And, um, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm executive producer and I write that show too. But yes, <laughs> I'm on that show. And that's been a new thing. You can live in obscurity being a comic book, you know, writer. You know, even if you're at the top of the food chain, I don't know if, you know, name whoever is a big star right now. They can probably make it through life without somebody bugging them. But there's something about that TV thing, man, where people, um, they're a little more recognizable. So, um, you know, I'm usually cool with people when they come up to me and they say something. With TV, um, Philadelphia, you said it was, last time we talked to you, you said it was in a, you were writing a pilot for it? Yeah, I finished the pilot. Uh, we have an actor attached. We got to get a director and we need a couple more actors. Uh, it's such a slow process. And because I have a couple of things in development already at HBO and I'm doing the show that I'm on and I'm writing movies and I'm writing a bunch of other books at the same time. It's hard to 
like all day, every day, just focus on Philadelphia, the TV show. But I desperately, desperately, desperately want to kill it off the TV show. And I just saw an interview with the vampire the other night, uh, the TV show for AMC. And it's really, really good. It was really, really good in a way of, man, you know, I really want to get Philadelphia on the air. Um, so, yeah, you know, hopefully at some point it happens. Well, if you need any extras to get ripped apart. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Oh, you're going to need that. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. We, we rip people apart. Our vampires aren't, they don't, they're not kind about what they do. Oh, my guts would love to be all over the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of, of uh, vampires, you got Blackula coming out um, next year, right? Yes. Yeah, Blackula in January. Um, it's a beautiful book. And I usually don't talk about anything I'm involved with um, in that way, but Jason's art is incredible. He painted the whole book. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. When, when you approach something like that, is there is there a different, I guess, feeling attached to it? Um, I mean, I loved the movie as a kid. I saw it as problematic as I got older. But when I was nine years old, it was the greatest thing I think I'd ever seen in life because I'd never seen black people get eaten before and um, on television and I mean, on the movies. You know, usually uh, they pass through. You never saw them with the Hammer films or you never saw them with um, any of the other Draculas. They were kind of lofty and vampires were in a castle and whatever, it was the black people in castles. So I wanted to bring a certain amount of... Um, class to you know blackula and do him in a way where there was more thoughtfulness beyond the fact of the movie it's like the movie did some things really really well and other things i think were just sort of victims of the day and the way they made movies during the black exploitation era i wanted to take away some of the things that didn't work keep the things that did work and add some things that i thought could move him into the future and sort of like with Philadelphia, you know, there are a lot of times when I write a script and I see it in my head one way and Jason will top whatever it is that I'm thinking. Like literally when I'll see the page, it's what I said, but it's way better than what I saw. And because Jason's a director, like as an artist, he's not just an artist, like he really directs the movement. And so, you know, for me, I'm always looking at it like, um, how can I elevate the material um, so as to not completely sort of, again, like in an interview with the vampire, um, I'm not completely doing away with everything, um, but I'm adding enough stuff to it so that it's familiar, but it's also new. When Philadelphia was coming out, you think you had a like, what was it Chris Rock and different people? Yeah, Chris mm -hmm. Rock, Brian K. Vaughn. Like, how does it feel to have like these big names like that reading your book? Like, how or how did they? Is it something that you sent them? Like, hey, check out my book, or is it just something that they ended up picking up? Or? No, I, I, it was different in every situation. I had a pilot with Jordan Peele back in the day at Comedy Central, and we used to talk horror, and um, I had him read it. He read volumes one and two. Um, well, he read issues one and two, and he dug it. And then um, Chris Rock is a friend. I had him read it, and he dug it. Um, Brian K. Vaughn, I think, came through Jason because they were doing some stuff together, and he read it, and he dug it. Um, most of those blurbs came from whoever was, I uh, happened to be, um, you know, the RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan. I'm sitting at the table with him. What you read? And I send it in. Oh, man, it's pretty good. Could you give us a blur? Um, you know, that type of thing. Um, like Pat Oswalt came out of nowhere. One day I turned on Twitter and I had all of these hits and it was like, Pat Oswalt digs your book. Um, and that was unusual. Um, you know, so they come from everywhere. What's well, that? It's when something is genius and really good. I think the world notices, but we still feel like pe more people need to get on board with this already. And <laughs> always, always want more people. It's a tough one, you know. It's an indie book for one, and I think a lot of people think they know what it's about. You know, it's like if you explain it to them, you know, John Adams is a vampire. Immediately they check out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like. And wait a minute, George Washington too? And so you think it's like, um, 
you know, Abraham Lincoln, you know, whatever. Like that musical you saw. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's like you don't really know. Yeah, it's like Hamilton, you know, it's like, um, but if you sit down and read it, you realize it's not that at all. It's another thing altogether. But, you know, convincing people, it's hard to convince people. Well, when it when it's this good, it's really not like half the people that I talk to when I when I tell them what it's uh, what it's about or you know how why they should be picking this up and reading it, they're like, what? They get like you know, whoa! They they get mind blown immediately and then hand them a copy and then they're reading through the next day. They're like, dude, I blew through that. What the hell? Like that was so so. Well, thank you. I said, man, you're doing something right. <laughs> and, and you're building your own universe because you've got yes. the Cita, you've got the Philadelphia, you've got the Elysium Bar, and then you've got the yeah. stack. Story. Yeah. yeah. Was, was that the plan was to create a universe of all different monster types? <clears throat> I knew there was something missing in the way a lot of these stories were told uh, from my point of view. Like, they're great in their own way, but there were things that I wanted to add to them that was... Um, that were different. And I thought that there was a way to give a voice to, you know, people from different parts of the world, of our world, that um, you typically don't see in horror. And I just wanted to be able to speak at it from that place and not so much the place that it typically, there's a word that I hear a lot sometimes in stories that, you know, something that's cool, it's really, really cool. Um, I wasn't looking to be cool. You know, I was looking to more of doing a, a book that felt almost like a novel in a way, because um, that's what I dug. And books like Sandman and books like Swamp Thing and Miracle Man and some of the others, um, they felt like books when I read them. I walked away with a feeling. And I sort of infuse, or I try to infuse um, that in Philadelphia. I try to, when you walk away, I want, I want to leave something with you. You know, I, I want you to, you know, uh, Jason, I was talking to Jason because he does a great book, Empty Zone. And um, we were talking the other day about just writing. He was asking me about my process and how I do certain things. And I said, I always write with the last four pages in mind. I started the last four pages. I know I can't start a book unless I know where it's going to end. And so I'm writing to that ending. I'm writing to emotionally satisfying. From the first book, one thing that I got over and over and over again about the first issue of Philadelphia was, man, you really stuck the landing, you know, when he opens the coffin and he says, spoiler alert, what took you so long? Um, I had that in mind from the beginning. I had that before I had anything else that I knew I wanted the son to open the coffin and that's what his father was going to say. And so every time I approach an issue, I'm always writing with those last four pages in mind because I want, um, I want to make sure that it's moving to a place like the movie Aliens or Die Hard, I think are really perfect um, action movies, um, even though Alien is more of a horror action, uh, you know, or sci-fi action. But the way that they're paced is so perfect that it, every moment is sort of earned. And I want that in Philadelphia to be a similar experience when you're reading this book, that you're moving emotionally through a journey. It's not always plot driven. You know, oftentimes it's um, it's character driven. Sometimes I do I'll do a plot thing, but I get bored with it because virtually every big two book is a plot driven book. Some are different, you know, and some people do it um, their own style. But it's like if you're going to do an indie book, and you know, take your time, fall in love with it, and make it satisfy. With all the American history that you put into the Philadelphia, did you have to do like a lot of uh, like research or was this just like knowledge you already had from? 50-50. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of things, I'm a history buff of sorts, but um, certainly people know more as people would pick me apart in the beginning. You, George Washington never, and I'm like, okay, um, he's a vampire. He was never a vampire either. <laughs> <laughs> he was, I read uh, it. Yeah, if you read it, it was you like, know, it, with all of them, what I tried to do, the math of it was, you know, I, when they were human, I used real history. And then I create this bridge between real history into vampirism. And I try to take a shade of what they were as human beings. And I add that to that idea of them as vampires. Um, that's sort of what I do with each one um, of my historically based characters. And I wanted to create a world where I could deal with different periods of time, World War II, Vietnam, you know, I've mostly, 
for this earlier, the earlier stuff, it's mostly been around um, the Revolutionary War and uh, slavery and that period and the Civil War to a lesser degree um, with Toppy and some of the other ones. But I'd love to be able to deal with um, World War II and Vietnam in the 70s. I did have um, Thomas Jefferson as a rock star at Woodstock. Um, uh, but I'd love to be able to play with time. I love being able to play with history and take historical figures and put them in different places. When you when you're looking at a at the story, are are you trying to put out an idea, or is it more character driven? You're you're trying to shape a character and, and feel them. When, when it's, down. it's always character driven. It's always again. It goes back to an initial theme. You know, is it going to be anger? Is it going to be guilt? Is it going to be regret? Um, something. There's is, always is that internal, and you're putting mm -hmm. it out there. You, you're mm -hmm. just That's no. So it's always I, before I start. I put pen to paper, um, and it's weird because Jason will ask me sometimes, and it makes me really, really angry. He'll say, um, he'll say, uh, so what's the cover for twenty seven? I have no idea what the story for 27 is. Um, and then I do now. But the thing is, I will sit here and I'll say, okay, who's going to be the star of this book? What's going to happen? I have my assistant send me the last script to the last book. And I'll go through it and I'll read it. And I'll say, okay, I dealt with guilt in this story. I'm going to deal with anger in this one. And um, I have a general idea because we have war going on in the streets and I have some things that I have to cover because of that. I have to, what's going on with the quarantine, you know, Philadelphia right now is sort of sectioned off from the rest of the world and they've been left to their own. Um, and one of the bigger issues and one of the reasons why I'm approaching Arc 5, the way that I'm approaching it is there's so many characters at a certain point. You got four vampires, you got a witch, and you've got um, a bevy of vampires, you've got um, you had a zombie, you had a few zombies, Thomas Jefferson's kids for a minute. Um, there's so many characters to service that I find myself like, you know, I have to give each one of them something to do. And so I'm trying to thin the herd out a little bit right now, but still without. Um, losing that thematic idea of what each book is um growing up in uh with the 70s movies that you're talking about like the black exploitation is uh is shafta on your mind to ever write yeah but the rights are hard um okay. Okay. The, the getting the rights to these things um it'll uh it's never easy um i wanted shaft i wanted shaft when i got blackula i was gonna have shaft and blackula in a book um that Shaft was hunting Blackula down. Um, that was my initial idea when I went to MGM. But uh, the great David Walker did some great stuff um, with Shaft, and that was kind of cool. The original Richard Browntree Shaft, not the Sam Jackson later Shafts. But, um, you know, if he falls in my lap at some point, I'd love to do a mystery with him. Uh, Cole Shack the Night Stalker is the same thing. I'm doing a story for Moonstone right now for the 50th anniversary of Cole Shack. It's actually done. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to be able to play with Shack. Nice. I've seen uh, Jason Sean Alexander do, like, some live paintings and stuff like that with uh, mm -hmm. Sienkiewicz, Mafood, all those guys. Um, would you ever step up and, and write some some poetry on screen? Or sure. Yeah. Some live. What would that look like? How would that? I have no idea. Um, that sounds I mean, fantastic. I don't know what it is, but it, it just crossed my mind. And I think that might be fun. Yeah. I mean, I think because I write so I write comics instinctually, um, I kind of do that with everything. Um, I sort of don't have a plan sometimes when I'm writing. Um, so I'd love to take a shot at it. I have no idea what it would look like, but I'd love to take a shot at it. We'll provide the booze and the music. <laughs> yeah. I try to write Killer Duffy like that some ways. You know, sometimes I try to write like it's poetry. Every time you're meeting with somebody and you, you have an Instagram post, you have that green background. Yeah. What is that? Uh, it's, a restaurant, that? <laughs> it's a restaurant called Delmonico's that just closed uh, two weeks ago. Um, they're looking for a new location. 
Uh, for 10 years, that was my booth. And if you look at the gold plate in the back, it says reserved for Rodney Barnes. And um, I started going there to write. And then eventually I started having meetings there. And one day I took a picture in the booth and I posted it. And uh, I had someone call me and say, hey, you know, next time we go there, could you take a picture with us? And it started becoming a thing. And so I just kept doing it. That sucks that it's it closed. I agree. I hope they find a new spot. If, if they don't, are they going to send you that booth? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the plaque. They should send me a plaque. <laughs> but, um, we'll see. Right now, I think they're mourning the loss of the place itself. Somebody raised the rent and blah, blah, blah. We're going to cut it short and we're going to thank you for uh, being with us because we know you're so busy and you've got so much going on and, and you got to jump on a, a plane soon. I do have to jump we, on. We appreciate your time. Like You're you're like our favorite writer. We, we were so happy to finally meet you when yeah. Philadelphia did come out. It was during the pandemic and we were so bummed because we're like, damn, it would have been so nice because Comic-Con was happening, gonna, supposed to happen. We got mm -hmm. canceled and we've been like, that would have been a big impact for the book as well if it was at Comic-Con that first year that it came out. Yeah. But, but yeah. we're still surviving. We're still hanging in there. So you know, hopefully, it's, we'll, it's a hopefully we'll make it to 50. You will. You will. Yeah. As, long, will as, we're, as long as we're here, we'll keep uh, making sure we're passing that, that number one trade okay. out to everybody. And when that hardcover comes out, each one of us are going to be owning it. And yeah. we're going to make sure our shop picks up multiples. Because like we say, Philadelphia is our our top book every every time it drops. And we Can't thank you guys enough. Really appreciate it. Thank well, you thank so you. very much, Thank Rodney. you, Rodney. Have a good night. Have a good night. Take it easy. Talk to you guys soon. All right. All right. Good night.